The only reason you might know his name is because he was one of the best. If Kirk Kerkorian had his way, the general public would have no idea who he was or what he did. Instead of being the one at the podium telling the world what he had just done, Kirk could most often be found in the background of those pictures. In theory, for an industry and a capitalist economy to achieve its maximum potential, there are three steps in its evolution. Startup, expansion, and mergers and acquisitions. For most businesses operating within that industry, there comes a time to sell. It's an essential element of economics. And while they're often villainized, for a proper economy to advance, it requires corporations. The opportunity to be a part of this economic growth and its evolution was the reason E. Perry Thomas moved to Las Vegas. When he arrived, phase one was already well underway. He would make it his life's work to help facilitate phase two and three. Kirk Kerkorian would play a significant role, possibly the most significant, in all three steps of that evolution. At one point becoming the largest gaming corporation in the world. Kirk's family fled a Turkish massacre in their hometown by hiding in a cattle boat. When they arrived in California in 1905, his nearly illiterate father managed to buy several fruit farms through hard work. The family often overextended themselves and had to move constantly to avoid bill collectors. To help the family survive, Kirk quit school in the eighth grade and worked odd jobs. He would eventually learn how to box and was well on his way to becoming a professional before he learned how to fly and shifted all his passion towards that endeavor. He wanted to be a pilot for the military, but lacked the education required to do so. So he learned all he could from whoever would teach him, eventually becoming an instructor at an air academy. As the United States entrance into World War II became inevitable, Kirk had a friend forge a letter stating he had graduated from high school so he could enlist. Kerkorian was offered a captain's commission to be an instructor, training new cadets to become pilots. But Kirk was more interested in flying than teaching others to do it. So instead, he got a job as a civilian pilot when the U.S. joined World War II, delivering planes to Allied soldiers in Scotland and England after they were done being built. It was a dangerous job that saw a quarter of the pilots involved crash during delivery. Despite a few close calls, Kirk never had any major issues. When he returned home, he took the $5,000 he had saved and bought military surplus cargo planes so he could recondition and resell them for a profit. He did this until he earned enough to buy a small charter air service that operated in Los Angeles. It became a popular service for celebrities and the wealthy to use to hop over to Las Vegas for the weekend. One of those people was a man named Marion Hicks, a real estate developer from LA who built the El Cortez and later the Thunderbird, which he ran for a time. When its routes expanded to international destinations, the service became Trans-International Airlines. It was the first charter airline to operate jet aircraft. It was during this time that Kerkorian and Howard Hughes had their first professional dealings with one another via their airlines. Kirk quickly learned two things about Howard. First, Howard usually got what he wanted, and it didn't really matter where anyone else was in line at the time. Hughes always seemed to end up in the front. And second, working with Hughes was not always a productive exercise. By 1955, Kirk was earning $100,000 a year with his airline and decided he wanted to invest in another industry that would one day require the two to again operate in the same sphere of existence, the gaming industry in Las Vegas. Kerkorian tried to buy 3% ownership in the Dunes in 1955. Despite quick approval to purchase 1% for 50000 the Dunes was poorly run and competing against a rapidly expanding market. After new leadership cycled in and out, Kirk's investment was financially valueless, but he learned a valuable lesson. Don't invest in a business you don't run. In 1962, Kirk sold Trans International Airlines for just under a million dollars to the Studebaker Automotive Company. He used that money to buy 40 acres of land on the Strip, across the street from the Flamingo, and planned to build his own casino. But in 1964, Studebaker needed to offload assets to address financial problems and put the airline up for sale. So, Kirk bought his airline back at a discount. 
However, that move forced him to abandon his plans to build in Vegas, because he didn't have enough money to do both. So he rented the land to Jay Sarno for $190,000 a year, as well as 15% of the casino's earnings. Jay built Caesar's Palace on that land, and Kirk made close to $4 million a year from the rent. In 1967, Kokorian once again sold his airline, this time to Transamerica, and returned to Las Vegas with a plan to not only build a new hotel casino, but with a plan on how to run it. First thing he did was buy an 82-acre site on Paradise Road for $5 million and announced plans to build the International, the largest, most luxurious property in Las Vegas. No one had ever attempted to build a strip-type resort off of Las Vegas Boulevard before. At the time, the only thing off-strip were restaurants, modest motels, the convention center, the landmark project that had been sitting unfinished for close to a decade, and lots of undeveloped desert land. But Kokorian reasoned that people who drove up and down the strip to visit various properties and see different shows wouldn't have a problem going a block or two east to visit the sort of resort he had in mind. And if that were the case, it only made sense to purchase land far less expensive than that available on the Strip. While the international project was in the developmental phase, Kokorian also bought the Flamingo for $12.5 million. Kokorian knew the only way that he could create the kind of resort that he wanted to build, he would need to not only learn how to run a property in Vegas, but he would need to train the staff to support it in advance. The original plan was to learn all that he could then sell the Flamingo once the International opened. However, the Flamingo was an instant moneymaker, so instead he kept the property and invested $2.4 million to renovate and expand it. In his first full year running the Flamingo, its reported revenue was triple what was reported the year before. Just as final preparations were being made for the International groundbreaking, Howard Hughes announced renovation plans of $150 million that would make the Sands the largest hotel in the world, with 4,000 rooms, the world's largest bowling alley, an ice skating rink, a movie theater that would show unreleased films, as well as an indoor golf course. However, the announcement was nothing more than an attempt to discourage Kerkorian from building the International, and potentially challenge Hughes' status as the most important person in Las Vegas. While secretly concerned, the announcement didn't even delay Kirk's progress on the international project. That being said, despite a glowing track record, the announcement may be at least one of the reasons why Kerkorian had trouble finding a bank that would loan him the $60 million he requested for the international project. Some speculate that, specifically in Bank of America's case, even though they had already had several successful dealings with Kirk, they wouldn't loan him money for the project because they were Howard Hughes' primary bank at the time, helping him in his Las Vegas buying frenzy. This rumor was substantiated when late in 1968, Bank of America loaned Kerkorian $73 million to purchase controlling interest in Western Airlines, an industry Hughes was no longer in. Others say Kerkorian had trouble because people didn't believe the project was real. Whatever the reason, Kirk was only able to get $30 million from the Nevada National Bank and another $5 million by selling the land he was leasing to Caesars. Despite being underfunded, the project broke ground with hopes that progress would reassure investors to loan him the rest of the money required to finish it. The plan all along was to go public with the company at some point, but Kirk would decide to expedite that and use the sale of stock to finance the remainder of the project. Realizing the Super Sands project wouldn't stop the International from being built, Hughes tried to oppose new legislation already in the works to help corporations move into the casino industry. Interestingly enough, development on this legislation was introduced largely to help Hughes conduct his great land grab and avoid the standard public requirements for a gaming license. Eventually accepting opposing legislation wasn't a viable option to deter Corian, Howard abandoned it and Kirk was able to raise $26.5 million from the sale of stock in the new company, International Leisure. Hughes' last attempt to prevent the International from being built was to play friend and concerned colleague. In a series of letters to Kokorian, Hughes shared his concerns that the nuclear testing being done in Nevada were a danger to high-rise projects like the International and the Super Sands. 
Hughes announced his plans to abandon the Super Saiyans project and tried to convince Kirk to stand with him in opposition of further testing by refusing to build his project as well. Gregorian didn't share the same concern and continued developing the International. Finally accepting he couldn't stop Krikorian from building, Hughes did the only thing left he could think of. He would build a better casino. Howard Hughes purchased the unfinished Landmark Project, also located along Paradise Road, less than a city block south from Krikorian's International. Hughes' plan was to finish and open the Landmark before the International, believing that would hurt the success of Krikorian's property. While Hughes accomplished his goal of opening before Krikorian, one day before, it did nothing to hurt the massive success of the International. By the fall of 1969, the 16.6 million worth of stock Krikorian owned in International Leisure became valued at $180 million. But Kirk's attention was already drawn towards his next project. The movie industry had been in decline since the late 40s as television grew in popularity. With only one in six movies released making back the money it cost to make it, by the late 60s, studios had to reorganize the way they did business in order to remain solvent. This caused companies like MGM stock to become undervalued and ripe for acquisition. In 1969, initial rumors were that Howard Hughes was going to purchase the studio, but that never materialized. Instead, Kirk Kokorian bought it. In 1970, the first loan was coming due for the International. The plan was to have a second round of stock offering in International Leisure to pay down the loan and refinance the remaining amount. While preparing to make that offering, the SEC was attempting to build a case against Meyer Lansky for tax evasion and requested the books from Lansky's time as owner of the Flamingo from Krikorian. As one can imagine, Financial records documenting the business dealings of organized crime weren't exactly included in the purchase of a Vegas casino. When Krikorian informed the committee that he didn't have such records, rather than believe him, the SEC chose to put an indefinite hold on the second round of stock, despite appeals from legal teams arguing that it made no sense for the SEC to allow them to go public, but not allow them to have a second round of stock offerings. They also pointed out that the Flamingo showed dramatic gains after Krikorian took over, demonstrating he wasn't involved in whatever previous owners were alleged to be a part of. Even a plea from then Nevada Governor Paul Laxalt couldn't sway the SEC. Rather than default on loans and allow his reputation to be degraded, Krikorian concluded that he had no alternative but to sell international leisure. While that process took time to fend off other troubled holdings, Krikorian started selling off personal assets to pay off loans coming due. In July of 1970, Hilton Hotels purchased 37.5% of international leisure for $37 million. A year later, Krikorian sold the rest of his interest in international leisure to Hilton for another $31.8 million. While all this was going on, with Krikorian as majority owner, MGM returned to profitability, largely a result of cost-cutting and the liquidation of a significant portion of their backlot assets. In 1971, MGM announced plans to seek new revenue streams by diversifying the brand and moving into new markets, specifically the leisure market. MGM would build a fleet of luxury cruise liners and the world's largest hotel casino in Las Vegas. No Hollywood-based enterprise in history had ever expanded into markets outside of entertainment movies, music, TV, etc. Gregorian reasoned that the iconic MGM name would have the ability to attract a global audience. Some question why MGM didn't just purchase international leisure if they wanted to move into this market. The truth is, many believed that Gregorian had simply sold the Flamingo once he opened the international, as was the original plan. The whole SEC issue would have never happened and he would still own the international. So if a Krikorian-owned MGM purchased international leisure, MGM would be forced to deal with the same SEC situation that caused Kirk to sell it in the first place. Instead, MGM and Krikorian announced plans to purchase a 42-acre plot of land on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Flamingo Road, across the street from the Dunes, for $6.7 million, and build a 2,000-room strip resort 
for $75 million. 16 of those acres belong to TL Corporation, owned by Kerkorian, which means he basically sold the land to himself. While this practice is completely legal, it sounds shady every time you hear about it happening. Adding to the questionable nature of such a practice, Kerkorian was paid $5 million for his 16 acres, while Reality Holdings, the company that owned the other 26 acres, was paid $1.7 million. Apparently, investors and the board of directors felt the same way, as the stock price dropped after the announcement, and in 1971, a class action lawsuit was filed against Krikorian to prevent him from selling his land to MGM. It was eventually reasoned that the land Krikorian owned was more valuable, not only because of its location on the corner, but because it already had a closed Bonanza Hotel Casino on site that would only need a modest reinvestment in to reopen and generate income while the new project was in development. So MGM bought the land, reopened the Bonanza, and the new MGM resort was projected to be completed in 1974. Krikorian brought many of the people who helped him build the International on board to work on the MGM project, including architect Martin Stern Jr. Construction began before final working drawings were complete, and progress on the project was so rapid that Kokorian earned the reputation for building the fastest hotels in Las Vegas. The new property would have portraits of iconic MGM moments and actors in the halls and lobby, have a 25-floor tower with economical single rooms, as well as luxurious suites named after characters from famous MGM films, such as the Rhett Butler suite, a la Gone with the Wind. The gaming board gave the project special permission to build the structure higher than the nine stories it was zoned for, as well as gave permission to build less parking spaces than regulation required at the time. In 1972, it was announced that the new property would be named MGM's Grand Hotel, after the 1932 movie Grand Hotel, which had set box office records for the studio during the Great Depression. The final cost of the project would end up being $107 million. Whenever it encountered financial troubles, MGM Studios would sell off more assets to keep the project moving. On December 31st, 1973, 210 days ahead of schedule, the MGM Grand opened with Dean Martin as their opening night entertainment. It was billed as the world's largest casino at 140 yards long with 25 bars and the world's largest shopping area in a hotel at 75,000 square feet, named the Grand Arcade. Despite a two-month oil embargo that required the rest of the Strip to dim their lights, the MGM Grand Hotel was granted special permission to amp up to maximum wattage for their grand opening. The 125-foot marquee used incandescent point lights to replicate a movie land premiere. While they never came to fruition, the Golden Lion that MGM is known for was considered for the marquee. Plans were for an eight-foot-high gold-finished fiberglass lion to sit on top of a 16-foot concrete base. But when it was learned that it would cost $700,000 to build, the plan was abandoned. The MGM Grand Hotel was a massive success from the moment it opened. Never in MGM's 50-year history had the company reported such excellent numbers. In the nine months left in MGM's fiscal year, the hotel casino generated $22 million in revenue, doubling the $11 million the film studio generated during the entire year. In profit, MGM reported $26.8 million, almost $9 million more than the studio's previous record high. Kokorian would continue to divest his interest in other companies so he could increase it in MGM and focus more of his attention there. By 1974, he owned 50.1%. The MGM Grand Hotel was so successful, the company expanded into Reno in 1978 and Atlantic City in 1980. However, on November 21st, 1980, around 7 a.m., an electrical short caused a fire at the property. With the hotel at 99% occupancy, it was reported that in the first 90 seconds, 14 people died. Due to the building materials used during construction, carbon monoxide and cyanide traveled with the fire through the resort 
restaurants, and even onto the casino floor. To clarify, the MGM didn't skimp on quality construction materials. Far from it. The problem was the way building materials were produced at this time in history that caused the rapid movement of fire throughout. Making matters worse, as the fire spread, even when smoke rolled into the casino area, gamblers didn't stop playing. Assuming whatever the issue was, the property had it under control. Helicopters were brought in to attempt rescue for those stranded in the hotel tower, but the overhangs on the balconies prevented them from getting slings close to people. The rescue personnel were forced to get as close as they could, then throw them. All told, they rescued close to a thousand people. By 9.30 a.m., the majority of the fire was extinguished. In total, 76 guests and nine employees died. 650 people were injured. The Las Vegas fire chief later said, if the property had sprinklers when the fire started, it would have been a minor incident with mostly only water damage. In the aftermath, the surrounding properties came to MGM's aid. The Dunes opened its convention center and set up a first aid station, and employees from Caesars and Flamingo helped out with traffic and anything they could. Barbary Coast moved its gaming tables and closed its casino for three hours to do the same, as well as give away free food and refreshments to survivors. It was the longest self-imposed shutdown at the property since the funeral of John F. Kennedy in 1963. It's projected the property lost ten to $20,000 as a result of the closure. The following day, 3,000 survivors returned to the property to stand in line and wait to be escorted to their room to reclaim what was left of their belongings before being relocated to other properties. 90 days after the MGM fire, Krikorian's former resort, now the Hilton, also had a fire that killed eight people. These tragedies sparked major legislative changes regarding building materials and fire prevention systems mandated for all public buildings. Eight months after the fire, the MGM Grand reopened on July 29, 1981 as one of the safest hotels in the world. With a new hotel tower, a $5 million fire safety system, posted emergency exits, as well as a PA system throughout the property. The new system had 24-hour computer monitoring, smoke detectors, ventilation dampeners, a 30,000-unit heat-activated sprinkler system with the ability to pump out 70,000 gallons of water per minute, covering virtually every square foot of the property. The sprinkler system was even tied to the pool as a backup source of water just in case the water supply dropped. The reinvestment worked instantly, and reassured patrons caused reservations in record numbers. When Bellman took people to the rooms, they would turn on the TV to show a public service announcement from Gene Kelly, demonstrating how the new fire safety system worked. As one would expect, in the wake of the MGM fire, there were lots of lawsuits filed. Kirk pressed for a quick resolution, saying, these victims were guests of our hotel. They shouldn't be treated as adversaries. But when the insurance companies dragged their feet, Kirk took matters into his own hands and paid out $69 million to settle all outstanding suits, then sued the insurance company to recoup his costs. In 1985, MGM sold the Grand Hotel to Bally's Entertainment for $550 million. It said Krikorian simply couldn't shake the tragedy and wanted to distance himself from the entire market. He believed that regardless of all the safety upgrades they made to the property, it would forever be associated with the tragedy. His absence would be short-lived. In 1987, Krikorian bought the Sands and Desert Inn for $167 million. But these were nothing more than investments to turn around and sell at a profit to help finance the real project. In 1989, he sold the Sands to Sheldon Adelson for $110 million. And after running the Desert Inn for five years, sold it in 1993 to ITT. In 1989, Kokorian bought the Marina Hotel and Casino on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Tropicana, a 714-room nautically-themed resort that opened in 1975. Following his previous model for success, he immediately renamed the place the MGM Marina and continued to keep it open while plans for a new MGM Grand were developed. During the design process, 
environmental preservation was in the minds of all. Not only did they incorporate things like energy efficient lighting and water conservation programs, it was determined that rather than destroy the solid structure that was the existing Marina Hotel, they would simply strip it down and incorporate it into the new plans. It would come as no surprise that those plans would be for Kerkorian to once again build the largest resort in the world, the third time he had done it in Las Vegas in 25 years. Needing more room to accommodate such a project, they purchased the 100-acre Tropicana Country Club, located next to the marina, across the street from the Tropicana Hotel and Casino. On November 30th, 1990, the marina closed, and the site was prepared for the project, which broke ground on October 7th, 1991. Employing 1,500 workers, construction costs averaged $1 million a day. On February 23rd of 1993, MGM celebrated the placement of the final emerald green glass panel on one of the four wings of the 30-story hotel tower. Celebrating, or advertising, the number of rooms the property would have once it opened, 5,005 green balloons with gift certificates good for one complimentary night at the property were released. On December 18, 1993, the new MGM Grand opened as the largest hotel in the world. The resort's final cost to build was $1 billion. When it opened, it was heavily Wizard of Oz themed, not just in the emerald colored glass used on the exterior of the building, but inside as well. The grand entrance of the property was an unmistakable giant yellow lion, meant to represent the famous MGM logo featuring Leo the lion. Guests would walk between the paws and under the head into the property and be greeted by the main characters of the Wizard of Oz at the beginning of the Yellow Brick Road and leading to the Emerald City attraction. Along the road to the attraction, various slot machines had jack-in-the-boxes on top of them that munchkins would pop out of. Looking up at the ceiling, you could see a silhouette of the flying Wicked Witch of the West. The attraction was a walkthrough of the movie complete with a cornfield, apple orchard, haunted forest, as well as audio animatronic figures of Dorothy, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion, and the Wicked Witch of the West. The walkthrough would end at The Wizard's Secrets, a live multimedia magic show. But the MGM Graham was much more than just Wizard of Oz themed. In fact, it had four themed casino areas. The Hollywood Casino had marquees, bright lights, celebrity lookalikes, as well as the center stage lounge. The Monte Carlo Casino is where you would find the table games and the Betty Boop Bar. And predictably, you could guess what you would find in the sports casino and its turf club lounge. But the Wizard of Oz theme zone was the largest, with the Flying Monkey Bar located within. The MGM Grand aspired to be the first true, complete destination hotel in Vegas that catered to all needs. Part of that concept was the MGM Grand Adventures theme park. The park used the slogan, follow the yellow brick road, because if you follow the one in the casino, it would lead you right to the theme park. On 33 acres, the MGM Grand Adventures theme park was as large as Disneyland. When it opened, tickets were $25 for adults not staying at the resort, considered expensive in comparison to those of similar parks at the time. The price would eventually be reduced to help increase attendance. The park opened with such attractions as the Backlot River Tour, a boat tour attraction through various movie set mock-ups and special effects demonstrations, deep earth explorations, a simulator ride similar to Star Tours at Disney that had the windows of the vehicle open at various times during the tour so riders could see special effects outside along the route. The Lightning Bolt, an indoor space-themed roller coaster with a top speed of 32 miles an hour and ended with a flyby strip view, which was really nothing more than a large model of the strip. In 1996, the park added Skyscreamer, a 250-foot sky coaster. However, the park didn't do as well as they had hoped and didn't have the kind of attractions that encouraged repeat visitors. Seeing more value in other traditional Vegas concepts versus reinvestment in the park, in 1997, MGM decided to expand the resort's pool area. To do that, they reduced the theme park's footprint by 40% 
down to 18.8 acres. The expansion meant the closing of the Backlot River Tour, Deep Earth Exploration, Manhattan Theater, the Haunted Mine Ride, as well as a reduction in operating hours. Originally opened year-round, in 1998, they went to seasonal, operating April through the summer. In September of 2000, it was announced that the theme park would be replaced by luxury condos, today known as the Signature. In 2001, the theme park did not reopen and was renamed the Park at MGM Grand, available for rent by corporations for functions. The final event in the space that somewhat resembled the theme park was a Jimmy Buffett concert on Memorial Day 2002. The theme park wasn't the only thing to be short-lived at the new MGM Grand. In 1996, just three years after it opened, the entire theme was scrapped in favor of an Art Deco motif to capture the essence of classic Hollywood. MGM started billing themselves as the City of Entertainment and Maximum Vegas, related to all the activities they offered at the property. The original giant lion at the entrance of the property was removed because Chinese gamblers avoided the casino or used alternate entrances because it's considered bad luck to enter under the mouth of a lion in Asian culture. In 1998, MGM closed the entrance and instead placed a 45-foot-tall, 50-foot-ton bronze statue of the studio icon, the largest bronze statue in the U.S. In 1999, they also introduced the lion habitat inside the casino, housing up to six lions on display daily. Those concerned about the limited space the lions lived in were reassured that they didn't live in the habitat. They lived with their trainer, Keith Evans, on a ranch some 12 miles outside of Las Vegas. Back in 1992, when MGM was being built, Kerkorian purchased the 18-acre site across the street for $31.5 million and offered MGM Grand Inc. a two-year option to buy it from him. In 1994, Prim Resorts, known at the time as Prima Donna Resorts, approached MGM with an idea to build a New York-themed resort on the land. The two companies teamed up, and construction began in March of 1995. At a cost of $460 million, New York, New York opened on January 3, 1997. From the beginning of the project, analysts predicted that MGM or Prima Donna would buy out the other partner so that they could own the property outright. However, MGM decided instead to buy Prima Donna Resorts, the entire company, at a cost of $612 million. Led by Jim Murin, who joined the company in 1998, this move began a new concept for Krikorian and MGM and their Las Vegas holdings, one that would come to redefine the company and move the market into the final phase of economic evolution, corporate acquisition. The purchase of Prima Donna Resorts was completed in 1999, adding three casinos and two golf courses to the MGM portfolio. In 2006, MGM sold everything in the Prima Donna portfolio to Herps Gaming for $400 million. Everything except for New York, New York and the Prim Valley Golf Club. But before that happened, MGM changed the Las Vegas market in a way it had never been seen before and would begin the great consolidation of the gaming industry. In 2000, it purchased Steve Wynn's Mirage Resorts one of the company's biggest competitors for $6.4 billion. Four years later, it would acquire another gaming giant in Mandalay Resorts for $4.8 billion. In 10 years, without building a single property in Las Vegas, MGM and Krikorian became the largest gaming operation in the world, owners of 10 properties in the Las Vegas Strip alone. Mandalay Bay, Luxor, Excalibur, New York, New York, MGM Grand, Monte Carlo, Bellagio, Mirage, Treasure Island, Circus Circus, and Slots of Fun. The details surrounding these deals will all be covered in detail in the 360 Vintage Vegas titled The Great Consolidation, the culmination of our 360 Vegas Evolution series. MGM didn't build a new property in Vegas again until they partnered with Dubai World in 2005 
to build the Mixed Use City Center project. Build as a city within a city, comprised mostly of condos and retail, with Aria Hotel and Casino as its centerpiece. Championed by the man who would replace Gregorian as CEO, Jim Murin, the city center project was referred to as both ambitious and the biggest bust in the history of real estate. A project that, at an estimated $9.2 billion, was the largest privately funded construction project in world history. To date, it has been a financial failure after the Great Recession destroyed the condo market. In fact, City Center almost bankrupted MGM, at one point causing them to sell off Treasure Island to former New Frontier owner Phil Ruffin for three quarters of a billion dollars just to stay solvent. No one was immune to the impact of the Great Recession, but it's possible no one was impacted more than Kirk Krikorian, losing an estimated $14 billion in net worth by 2009. All that being said, the company didn't go bankrupt, and City Center, in one form or another, is trending upward, with Aria as the focal point, ditching the city within a city concept, as well as the name City Center. They even sold the Crystal's high-end shopping mall to Invesco in 2016 for $1.1 billion. While active in the company until he died, Kirk Krikorian stepped down from the board of directors in 2011. In 2015, at the age of 98, Kirk Krikorian died, the second oldest billionaire in the world, leaving most of his estate to the American Red Cross. Today, MGM Resorts International is considered one of the premium names in gaming, with properties in Atlantic City, Mississippi, China, and projects in development for Maryland and Massachusetts. Intensely private, Gregorian's legacy may not be as well known as Steve Wynn's, but is unarguably one of the most important in Vegas history. Some will criticize MGM as the shining example of the faceless corporate machine that has taken over the city, but without the corporate evolution of the market, the expansion of gaming around the United States and the world for that matter would have never been possible. Corporations removed the negative stigmatism the gambling industry had for eons and made it a viable, bordering on respectable business model, now regarded as just another form of entertainment. I'm grateful that by sheer coincidence, I was in Las Vegas the day Kirk Corian died. It allowed me the chance to reflect upon his legacy while being immersed in it, contemplating his part in developing the city that has changed my life, redefined it, and the legacy I'll leave, however small its contribution. Hey!